Today's a very special day. Four folks were baptized, uh, and uh, added to this New Testament church. Today, four believers demonstrated their faith in Jesus by their getting baptized in front of a crowd. I've had folks say, well, I know I need to get baptized, but can me and you just do it alone sometime? That's kind of missing the point. Baptism is a public declaration. It's a public identification of what you claim to believe. What I want to do, just a few minutes, in a simple message, is visit this question. Uh, what just happened here? I want to welcome everybody uh, to our church, folks that have been coming for decades and folks that just came out today for this occasion. Thank you so much for celebrating this special time um, with us. And uh, I want to um, also just kind of take a, a minute. I didn't before. If you got a visitor's packet, I, uh, you got a visitor's card, please take time to fill that out if you didn't already and hand it to me on, the, on your way out. That, that would be fantastic. And don't forget, we do have a time of a fellowship and food after church. So what just happened here? Did these folks just get their sins washed away? Or was something else going on? Come to think of it, if they didn't get their sins washed away, how do we get our sins washed away? And <coughs> if they didn't get their sins washed away, what just happened here? There are folks that say, listen, if you don't get baptized, you're not going to heaven. But baptism is like a wedding ring. I want you to think about it this way. They both symbolize a transaction that already happened. A wedding symbolizes a marriage just as a baptism symbolizes salvation. Wearing a wedding ring doesn't make you married any more than being baptized makes you saved. And to extend the parallel, if a person doesn't wear a wedding ring, you can almost assume that the person isn't married. So the New Testament times, if a person was not baptized, you could probably assume that they weren't a believer. You see, in the New Testament times, when somebody got saved, they got baptized. Now, today, I understand folks get saved at a young age, and you want to wait and see and make sure they understand, and they get baptized a little bit later, and that's what happened here. But in the New Testament times, when somebody gets saved, they get baptized. Now, yes, it's a decision of surrender, and yes, it's a decision to say, I do want to make this identification, but you know what? We don't know anywhere in the Bible where somebody gets saved and then walks around a long time without getting baptized. Because when somebody gets saved, they want to tell everybody, hey, guess what? I trusted in Christ. I have an interesting story about that that I'll tell at the end of our visit this morning. So when you get baptized, you're identifying with Christ. The Bible tells us in <coughs> Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, Know you not, so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So you're identifying with a few things. And the first thing that you're identifying with, when you got uh, baptized, and when these folks got baptized, they're identifying with Christ's death. And you would say, why in the world 
would you do that? Of all of the cool things in the Bible, why would I want to identify with something so dark? It's a good question. First of all, because it acknowledges that before Christ, you were dead. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. I want you to think about this. The Bible says, and you hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now tell me, at what point does a dead man walk out of a grave? Well, there is an answer to that. When an outside force resurrects him. Amen? These folks, all four of these folks said, I have trusted in Jesus. At one point, I was dead in trespasses and sins. You would say, these are kids. How could you say that they are sinners? Ask their parents. <laughs> you know what the Bible says? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I remember when I was young, I was brought up in church, and um, I remember coming under heavy conviction. Oh my goodness, I am afraid that if I were to die, I'd go to hell. I was reasonably young, but I remember I was so bothered. Now, anybody that knows me knows that this is an indication of me being bothered. I was so bothered, I didn't eat my supper. And it was a Wednesday night, and, and I'm just heaving and sighing and guilty and scared. And Dad looks at me and he says, what's wrong with you? with all of the compassion that he has. And I said, Dad, i got to ask you a question. He said, okay. I said, if I were to die right now, am I old enough to go to hell? And my dad said, if you're old enough to ask that question, you're old enough to go to hell because I realized I was a sinner. All has sinned and come short of the glory of God. I knew I had offended Almighty God. Therefore, I was responsible to, to find the answer. Now, when I identify with Christ's death, when you get baptized, you identify with the fact that yes, I am dead in my sins, and the price for sin is death. The Bible says the wages, payment, what you get for what you did, the wages of sin is death. Man, I knew I was in trouble. And every one of these people that got baptized said, you know what, I, there was a time when I said, I knew that I'm in trouble. Identifying with Christ's death. The price for sin isn't good works. It isn't try to do better. It isn't get baptized. It's death. And the Bible talks about a second death, the fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Uh-oh, and all liars. Have you ever, 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 ever told a lie? If you have, then you're in that category. And if you can speak, you've told a lie. And if you said, not me, you just told another one. Shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So I'm identifying, when I get baptized, I identify 
with, Christ, with Christ's death because I'm dead in my sin and because the payment for sin is death and because Jesus paid for my sin with his death. If I could get to, so we all know, okay, yes, 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 I'm a Christian, I believe Jesus died on the cross. There it is. Believe in the Bible, believe in the cross, okay, we get it. But if you believe that Jesus died on the cross, what are you trusting in to get to heaven? Oh, baptism will get me there. Wait a minute. If baptism would get you to heaven, then why did Jesus die? Think about this. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Jesus died paying the price that we deserve to pay. Here it is. But God commended. That means God demonstrated his love toward us. In that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So here I am. I'm dead in my sin. I can't do a thing to get to God. No work, no rite, no ritual. Take communion won't do it. Getting baptized won't do it. Joining the church won't do it. Walking an aisle won't do it. But Jesus, <coughs> he did it. He died for me, and I had nothing to offer him, and he died for me. Now, let's think about what actually happened when he died on that cross. For he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. Now think about that for a minute. So, 2,000 years ago on the cross, everything that you've ever done wrong, Jesus doesn't say just he paid for, he became it. Now that's intense. 2,000 years ago, Jesus became your sin. Everything you've ever done wrong. Everything you ever will do wrong, Jesus became that. So that, what? What's the rest of it? That we might be made the righteousness, what's the next two words? In him. Think about it. If I trust in what Jesus did on the cross, I say, okay, I know. I'm a sinner. I can't do it. But Jesus paid that price. So I'm going to believe what he did on the cross. I'm going to believe that his death paid for my sin. I'm going to accept that payment by faith and say, yes, I believe that. What does it say? It says, just like Jesus became my sin, I can become his righteousness. Now that's intense. That means you're not standing on the fact that just your sins are forgiven, now try not to sin again. That means you're standing not only with your sins forgiven, but with your sins taken off of the plate and all of the virtue, all of the good that Jesus does put on your plate or on your account in its stead. Man, that's a pretty good standing. What do you think? So let me, let me ask you, can Jesus, think about this, can Jesus ever become unrighteous? And since you're standing in his righteousness, can you ever lose your salvation? No, because you're not standing in your own. You're standing in his. Say, what if, what if a doubt flitters through my mind? I'm not standing on my faith anymore. I'm standing on his faith. What if I do something bad? I'm not standing on my good. I'm standing on his good. Man. So when you identify with Christ, you're identifying in baptism, you're identifying with his death. Then the Bible says you're identifying with his burial. Now what do we do? at a burial. At a burial, we put away the dead body. That's what a burial is. Um, it, 
a phrase in the Old Testament always kind of struck me as weird until I started putting together what the Bible is trying to teach us about burial. Abraham loved his wife Sarah. It was a strange love sometimes, but it was a love. You give me that? Amen? Amen. She died. And he was looking for a burying place. Can you remember what he wanted to, how he wanted to bury her, what he said about that? Can you remember that? Here's what he said. Do you, would you let me buy this cave so that I can bury the dead out of my sight? Now that's weird. Well, is it? You have, I remember when my grandma died and I was, I was uh, 12 and I was devastated and I'm staring at her casket and staring there, uh, uh, holding her hand and weeping and crying and uncontrollable. And my brother Dan, who, was a pre who is a preacher, older brother by about uh, 23, 24 years, put his hand on my shoulder he said, Donald, why are you staring at that thing? I was offended. I said, what do you mean that thing? That's grandma. He said, no, it's not. That's her old house. Grandma's up in heaven. Man, she's having a good time with grandpa and everybody else. That's her old house. You're just staring at her old house. And I started to get, oh, so when you bury the dead, you put it out of your sight, you know what, that's the old thing, that's the old stuff. Now the Bible says, <coughs> if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old man, what? Passed away. Guess what? I need to bury him out of my sight. When I'm, I'm identifying with baptism, I'm identifying, yes, Christ died for me. I was dead in my sin. Christ paid for me, my sin by dying. But my old man died too. That old sin nature died. My slavery to sin died. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead How shall we uh, that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Guys, when you were baptized, you were saying, yes, I'm identifying with Christ's death. But when I was buried, I'm also saying, and my old man, all those old desires, I'm putting those away. I'm not following that stuff. Now, I could follow that stuff, but I don't want to. I'm putting that away. Since our old man is dead, we're to bury it and choose not to follow its cravings anymore. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Reckon, count it to be so, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you're saying, you know what? And you've said, I died with Christ. I buried the old man. I am going to resurrect to a new life. Therefore, or let sin not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Now let's get to the good part. Well, all of, all of it's good, amen. Good to have your sins forgiven. Good to have your sins paid for. Good to have them replaced with the righteousness of Christ, amen. Good to take that old man, that wicked sin nature, that, that all of those desires, and bury that cotton-picking thing and leave it alone. Amen? Man, that's good. But then I'm going to identify with Christ's resurrection. When Jesus came back up out of the grave, <coughs> now, this could, be, this could be a trick question. It's not meant to be. When Jesus came up out of the grave, was he a different? Was he different? Yes, he was different. He had a glorified body. Amen? Could he die anymore? Could he walk through locked doors? Could he fly up into heaven? 
He had a different body. Right? Listen. When we identify with Christ through baptism, we're saying, I'm identifying with his death. Yeah, my, uh, my old man is dying, burying him, and I'm coming up to a new life, a new body. Watch this. The Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I have new desires. The Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. <coughs> when, when you trust in Christ, you start to have new desires. Guys, once you start to come to Christ and you start to really learn, you start reading the Bible and all of a sudden it starts making a little sense. All of a sudden you're like, man, I want to get into that, right? Why? Did you have that before? Not really. Now you do. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit. Oh! What else? You have put on a new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of of him that created him. New understanding. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now let me finish with this, guys. Part of the new life is a new family. We talked about this as these folks joined our church and Tom came back to our church. For as a body is one and hath many members, all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we're all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, and been made to drink of one spirit, uh, into one spirit. Have you trusted Jesus? If not, you need to today, before the end of the service. Amen? But if you've trusted Jesus, have you obeyed him by being baptized? And if you've been baptized, are you obeying him by being locked in to a local body that he has called you to? So I'm addressing the five that got baptized today and then everybody else that's a member of our church. This isn't just a church that you go to because it's the coolest church in town, although it is the coolest church in town. <laughs> it's a church you go to because God, in his providence, through the corridors of time, said, you know what? That guy, at that time, is going to that body to do that thing. God has called you to this assembly to function right where you are. Don't ever get seduced or called into other things that may be flashy or may be different. Listen, God's called you into this body right here, right now. I want to finish with an interesting story. And then, last question. He was willing to lay his life down for you. Will you take that one small step and declare your faith by being baptized if you haven't been baptized? Now, there are some folks who will say, I know uh, I ought to get baptized. I know I'm safe. I know how to get baptized, but it's not going to get me to heaven one way or another. So, nah, it's okay. I'll tell you a story. Apparently, it's a true story. And I want you to think about your willingness to follow God no matter what. You know, we'd like to say, oh, I love God. I love Jesus. I want to do what he says. But then they were asked to do something simple like, well, you want to get baptized in front of folks and join the church? And be like, maybe, 
may, maybe next time. Some time back, a retired mission, a missionary, this story is told by Fred Marks, a retired missionary dropped by our church. She served faithfully in Africa, and one day she happened uh, upon a small baptismal service. A fellow missionary took three converts to the center of a shallow river, and they dug a hole in the sand so that there would be enough water for baptism. Even then, the new believers were forced to sit in the sand so that there'd be enough water to cover them just for a moment. The missionary was telling the story. She saw what she had expected. A few friends and family members were there to watch. Missionary in the river raised his hand, repeating a familiar scripture before baptizing the converts. When the first convert came up out of the water. I mean, he began an exciting, joyful time of shouting. It was a quiet service otherwise, but this guy came up out of the water and just hollering, praise the Lord. A little bit odd. The second convert did the same, and the final convert also did the same thing. Afterward, the missionary watching the process asked about the unusual tradition. What's up with all the noise? I mean, I get being happy, but these guys are like elated. The missionary said, I haven't been able to completely communicate in the tribe's language. They heard the scripture that I gave them but didn't understand the symbolic nature of it. When I told them they would be buried with him through baptism into death and raised in newness of life, they thought baptism would kill them. We chuckled until the missionary froze us with her gaze and said, let me ask you a question. If you thought baptism would kill you, would you get baptized? Think about that just for a minute. That's not, you know, if people talk about easy believism. Man, they were saved before they got baptized, but boy, they demonstrated their faith. They said, you know what? If Jesus said do it and it kills me, then that's what's going to happen. I'm still ready to get baptized because I love Jesus. Man! So how about you? If you did die right now, are you absolutely sure you'd go to heaven? If not, you can trust Christ today. If you know you're going to heaven, have you been baptized? If not, let's talk about that. If you've been baptized, but you're not a member of a local church, you ought to be. Because you know what? That's what just happened here. Mm -hmm.